One of the stumbling blocks that people sometimes cite as being a reason why they don't adopt a Christian faith is the Bible. Isn't it an outdated, outmoded, odd and barbaric sort of book, they say, written in a pre-civilised age when they didn't really know any better? And don't we know better now? Haven't we moved on from them? Haven't we learnt a great deal? Hasn't the Bible, in other words, outlived its shelf life? Well, one person's stumbling block turns out to be another's cornerstone. And I want to spend this time arguing the case for the Bible. Um, not that I need to defend it as such. I believe it's uh, runaway success and compelling content speak very much for themselves. Uh, as the 19th century preacher Charles Haddon Spurgeon once said reputedly, defend the Bible, I'd as soon defend a lion. You don't defend the Bible, you open its cage and let it roar. To be sure, the Bible is indeed a, not a tame or domesticated text. It's not an anthology of niceties. Instead, it's a raw, passionate and quirky book which comforts the afflicted and afflicts the comfortable. It's a book with teeth, it bites, but that is precisely what makes it not only infinitely interesting, but also profoundly transformative. You know, I, I think a lot of people uh, suppose that if they'd been asked to write the Bible, they could have done a better job. But the thing is, uh, no one ever has. I mean, people have tried over the centuries, to do so, many of the greatest minds have had a go at writing various handbooks for life, manifestos, constitutions, sayings, philosophical tracts and treatises. But such books normally turn out to be bloodless, toothless, two-dimensional, monocultural. They achieve no lasting following, they affect no meaningful transformation. And their limited shelf life is proven by the obscurity into which they eventually sink. At best, they last as long as the culture that gave them birth before becoming museum pieces. But the Bible isn't like that. It's a pan-cultural phenomenon. It's outlived cultures, nations, civilizations. It continues to flourish in completely different settings. I don't know if you knew this, but it's the most translated book of all time. Uh, the entire Bible can be read in almost 700 languages uh, in its entirety. It, it parts or portions of it have been translated into over two and a half thousand more. So it's, it's the most translated book, but it's also the most popular book. The Guinness Book of Records estimates that there are more than five billion copies of the Bible that have been printed, which in publishing terms puts it in a league entirely of its own. Uh, an article in the New Yorker magazine added uh, the familiar observation that the Bible is the best-selling book of all time obscures a more startling fact. The Bible is the best-selling book of the year, every year. One of the most awkward questions therefore that people who say the Bible has outlived its shelf life have to answer is why, if it is so awful, outdated and irrelevant, is the Bible still flying off the shelves? Why, if it's so contemptible, do many in our world long for a copy and risk persecution, imprisonment and death by possessing one? If nothing else, the longevity, popularity and ubiquity of the Bible is a phenomenon that should give us pause for thought. And if you find yourself mystified why such a book should be held in such regard by so many and for so long, maybe that's a signal to stop and take it seriously, to look a little bit closer and ask, could there be something I'm missing here? Here's my uh, current Bible. As you could probably tell, it's uh, rather battered and dog-eared, um, and that's because it's uh, very much uh, valuable to me, much used and read. Um, I am, as you might say, an enthusiast. I carry this book with me everywhere I go. I uh, grew up in a Christian home and uh, my childhood was God saturated. I was brought up going to church. I was taught the God songs. 
I was pickled in prayer. Uh, I was nourished on the stories found in scripture, passionately retold and relived by my parents and Sunday school teachers. Noah and the Ark, David and Goliath, Jonah and the whale, Daniel and the lion's den, Jesus on the cross, Mary in the garden, Paul on the Damascus road. Scripture has ine inevitably shaped my life, my imagination and view of the world. But it wasn't until I was 17 years old or so that I first set out to read this book cover to cover for myself. And ever since then, I have never looked back. And the first thing I do every day, uh, other than feed the cats and uh, make a cup of tea, is to read this book and to pray. I read it, mull on it, chew on it. I recalibrate my life in the light of it. I don't do it because I have to do it as a, a chore or a duty. I do it because I want to. I want to. And if I don't do it, my day feels kind of like, ugh, it doesn't feel right. It's so uh, central to uh, who I am um, and what I want to be. Moreover, for the last 10 years, as a, as a church minister, my day job has been to read it, to teach it to help a community of fellow enthusiasts to live our lives in harmony with it. You know, Christians sometimes call themselves the people of the book and the passionate little communities called in our language churches, but which are found in their tens of thousands around, all around the world, uh, are formed around a sustained and living conversation with this book and the one to whom it introduces us. Now, the Bible is not just a book, it's actually a collection of 66 books written in three different languages on three different continents over a period of 1,500 years by approximately 40 different human authors. It's made up of poetry, parables, proverbs and prose. Uh, it's uh, a collection of moral law, historic narratives, apocalyptic visions, erotic verse even, prophetic utterances, song lyrics, biographies and letters. It is truly an astonishing, unique and unparalleled phenomenon of literature. And there's nothing else on the shelf like it. But at the heart of this rich, sprawling and multi-voiced conversation is a unifying concern and resonance, a golden influence a seam of divinity, a living story. The Bible itself um, says that it is God breathed. All scripture is God breathed, 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 16 says. Now isn't that an amazing phrase, God breathed. The claim is that this isn't just something that human beings have thought up or rustled up or co cobbled together somehow, that this actually something inherently godish about this book that within its pages there is a higher deeper wilder more ancient voice that speaks the voice that moves the stars the voice that roots the mountains the voice that first articulated the logic of all that is the voice that said in the beginning let there be light to live in tune with this voice is to live in concert with ultimate reality. And that's why Christians believe this book is so important. This is truth. This is solid ground. You know, we live today in a world that is awash with words. We are floundering, drowning in a seething mass of groundless chitter chatter. We spew out texts and tweets, sound bites and slogans, fake news, half truths, hashtags and clickbait, a sea and a clamour of noise with no fixed points. On what basis, we often ask, can someone build a good and meaningful life? Well, Christians say, on the unchanging word of God, that's what. You know, Jesus once said, Anyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a man who built his house on a rock. When the storms of life come and uh, 
beat against that house, still it will stand. The flip side is also true. If you build the house of your life on sinking, shifting sand, you end up with rubble and brick dust. Better to build on the foundation of the word. So you might I add, uh, if I were to read this book, if I were to give it a go, how would I begin? Where would I start? Well, I would argue that perhaps the best place to start is uh, in one of the Gospels, uh, that is the biographies of Jesus that um, begin the New Testament. Uh, they're called after their authors, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. And uh, if you feel a little bit intimidated with the, the largeness of this uh, copy of the Bible, you can you can get the Gospels um, on their own, set, published separately, and we get you a copy of one of these if you want it. We'll pop it through your door. This is a, a copy of Luke's Gospel that I'm reading at the moment with someone, and uh, and it's something you can carry around and read a little bit of each day, or you could sit down and read it in one sitting over a couple of hours with a cup of tea. And, and through the pages of such a book, uh, one of the Gospels, you uh, will meet the extraordinary and the compelling uh, figure of Jesus, the linchpin, and as it were, the epicenter of the Bible. And uh, as you read, the, read it, I, I, I believe you'll get a sense of what's at stake here and why this book is unique and eternally important. Now, if, if uh, books like this are, aren't your thing and you're more about uh, mobile phones and technology, you might want to download the Bible on your phone or uh, on your Kindle, uh, or you might want to use one of the many apps designed to help you read the Bible. Uh, I've been uh, recently reading the Bible in one year using the Bible in one year app uh, on my phone, which um, is great. And it has an audio Bible version so that you can listen to it if reading's not particularly your thing. Um, listening to sermons and podcasts, joining a home group or a Bible study, Meeting up one-to-one -to, -one to discuss what you're reading over a coffee are also incredibly helpful. The Bible belongs to the interpretive community of the church and the best place to come to understand it is in that context. So why not have a go? Why not make a start? Why not see what all the fuss is about? As you do so, I believe that you'll come to find that the only way uh, it might be true to say that the Bible has outlived its shelf life, is to realise that the Bible was never meant to live on a shelf in the first place, to gather dust as other books do. Actually, it was made to be an open book, continually read and discussed and applied. It was given as a transforming mirror for the soul, a living word, before an open heart.